Hi everybody. The uh, blog this week coming to you from Parkinson's Walks Towers Library. Well, in front of the bookshelf then. Same same thing. <laughs> we're uh, we're indoors as you can see because the weather has once more turned inclement, as it does. I have to say, oh, my burnham out there is going well, and I was hoping to feature that, but well, through the windows as good as it's going to get. Right. So the vlog, then let's start on our last vlog that we did, which was a couple of weeks ago. This is the one that included uh, Ben Self, the vote examiner, and his memorial flotilla. Uh, touching occasion, that. Peter Smith writes, The film of the Gloucester and Sharpness Canal brought back so many memories of the times that I managed it. Big important job there, Peter. All that steel piling... Still looks as good as when we drove it in over 50 years ago. Wow. A spot of useless information. Uh, here's uh, Peter starting a new section now on uh, Parkinson's Walks Vlogs. The um, spot of useless information <laughs> section. <laughs> I think most of the vlog gets covered in that, to be honest. The piles are 15 and 3 quarter inches wide. And the easy way to calculate the length that the pilot gang drove in a week was to count the number of piles, then add 25%, then add another 25% to that, and you have the distance in feet. None of this metric nonsense. At one foot three inches and then three quarter inches each, each measurement was a quarter of the of its predecessor. So then you finish off by saying, I must get out more. <laughs> I think we followed that, Peter, just about. <laughs> Andrew Merriman. The footage of Sumac, our uh, virtual mascot, or in the snow, reminded me of one of our family poodles. He loved snow, and once he got in it, you could not get him back in the house. <laughs> yeah. Must be a poodle thing then, I reckon. Jim Nichols, New Zealand. Great to see the blue sky as a reminder that spring is coming. But as you cruelly pointed out... <laughs> <laughs> cracks me up. <laughs> but as you cruelly pointed out, the opposite is true here, as our rather miserable summer comes into its last month. <laughs> I love seeing the canal and all the boats on it. That's another thing we don't have here. Canals. Along with castles, palaces, stately homes, <laughs> Roman remains, Stone Age fortifications, old villages, Relics of the Industrial Revolution or any history of any kind to speak of. <laughs> what have the Romans ever done for us? <laughs> oh dear. Watching videos such as this is the only way to keep alive memories of home. Since old age and Covid make it unlikely I'll ever get back for another visit. Oh blimey Jim. Never say never mate. Uh, Simon the hairy golfer. That little chapel always looks a little lost to me among all the new builds. Yeah, it looks small, doesn't it, amongst those warehouses? Yeah. I was surmising that in the days of sale, that would have been very well uh, used, I would imagine, if you're heading out into stormy seas. Michael, then, from Poland. You are some memories. I did indeed. If you've got any memories you want to share, folks, get them in. Mum's dad was a guy called Percy Paddock. I remember him very well. He was owner and landlord of the Angel Pub in Colford. He spent most of his working life in the cable works in Lydney, where he unfortunately lost part of one hand and a foot in an accident. Oh, blimey. I wonder what uh, health and safety would make of that. I wonder what the first aid facilities were too in those days. Blimey. Why don't you just phone up for an ambulance if there, if there was a phone, I suppose. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? His accent was incredible. It always fascinated me as a child. Yeah, well, I don't know, but the, uh, the, forest, uh, the forest dialect, brilliant. He had part ownership in a coal mine and was always letting me know that he was a free forester. Yeah, free to mine coal in the forest. Brilliant. James Weeks, who uh, Sumac, our official virtual mascot, allows to uh, stay in her house. James Week says, Sumac is still wondering what you mean with the barks. Arf! <laughs> but she died. <laughs> Sorry. 
but she does enjoy the, the attention. It's distemper, rabies and kennel cough vaccines tomorrow for Sumac, not me. I, I did wonder, James, yes. And I'll have to win myself back into her good graces with some more hide the ball in the deep snow game. <laughs> you can do it, James, you can do it. Uh, Sumac, on the other hand, says, Hi, Ron, you're actually getting better with the language. Da -da. I've told James that I believe you said, take Sumac outside to play ball now. <laughs> to his credit, he went out and got me a light up ball that works well in the snow at night. I've tried to lose it, but it's quite hard. <laughs> Rodney Masters. Rodney, you're not getting any better, man. <laughs> Good one, Ron. There must be some concern that GCHQ are monitoring your output. I walked past a GCHQ large area going back a few weeks. But their surveillance method is far from discreet. With a listening antenna placed over your left shoulder in today's vlog. <laughs> Have a good week. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rodney. Oh, dear. Right. Uh, last week's film. This one provoked tons of memories. Quite surprised at that, really. Yeah, I shouldn't have been. Tons of memories. Andrew Merriman, our railways expert, has someone who lived in Birmingham until 1981. That was quite a trip down memory lane. Mind you, the Science Museum has changed over the last 40 years. Yeah, I bet. The trams were still running when I was a youngster. And as a treat, my late mother would take me on them to visit my grandfather's grocery shop. Wow. There was a tram stop nearby. City of Birmingham looks just the same. That's the engine, not the uh, not the place. City of Birmingham looks just the same. And I think it's still in the same spot it was put in when it first arrived there. Not the easiest thing to move around. No, it wouldn't be, would it? Crike. I will never forget watching it going through the streets of Birmingham to its new home back in the 1960s. Wow. So Andrew actually saw that arrive in the 1960s. Blimey. He says, mind, it was not quite as clean then. So you must have had it as was, I suppose. Yeah, it's been cleaned up since then. Gary Dwyer, Australia. Hi, Ron. Very interesting visit today at the museum. There were lots of engineers who designed all that machinery. Very clever people. Yeah, of course. Oh, you look how complex it is. You think, how on earth they ever worked that out? Yeah, makes you wonder. He says, and you even found a dinosaur, something older than us. Hey, steady on, Gary. <laughs> Never mind the us. <laughs> well, you're probably right. Uh, harsh but fair. Right, James Weeks. James, I worked that. I figured out what's missing in my life. A steam engine. Thanks for helping me sort that out. Okay, a screw making machine too. <laughs> Mel Smith. That takes me back to when I visited the Museum of Science and Industry in Birmingham, as it was called back then in 1982, with my late dad. Back then there were lots of interesting exhibits related to manufacturing, like pin and screw making machines. Also, the locomotive moved back and forth. Does it still do that? No, it doesn't. No, it's just a stationary exhibit these days. Brilliant. Here's a video we made using very early analog video recorder. Uh, and if you go on to Mao's comment and uh, pick up the link, it's filmed some, some very uh, wobbly VHS tape as it was back then. And he's actually filmed the engine moving backwards and forwards. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Morris Johnson took me back to my childhood. Regularly visited on the trams in the 1950s. I remember a city in Birmingham Come into the Science Museum in Newell Street. So there's somebody else, and that was Maurice Johnson who was there when it actually arrived. Brilliant. Wow. Peter Smith. Thanks for reviving memories. Not for nothing was Birmingham once called the Workshop of the World. Yeah. The other side of the coin, Simon the Hairy Golfer. An engineering nation now serving overpriced coffee and burgers. <laughs> I think Simon was having a bad day. <laughs> Paul says, thanks for posting. Brilliant. Must visit. Yep. 
I think uh, this museum ought to give me a bit of commission here, to be honest, reviving its memories. Michael from Poland. A window into what Birmingham's finest used to make. I supplied the world with nearly everything you can think of. I love the transport section and how lovely to see LMS's City of Birmingham again. Yeah. Mark and Richardson looks an interesting venue to visit next time I'm in Brum. Brum is what the locals call it and there's another one. Jim Nichols, New Zealand. Lovely Ron, just lovely. I wish I could have joined you. Yeah, me too Jim. Peter Batty, when I were a kid, <laughs> when I were a kid, when the weather was bad, we would all traipse off to what was then called Museum for Science and Industry. It was located in Newell Street. Still is Peter. Many a day was spent playing and looking at all the exhibits, especially in school holidays. My, how times have changed. Now you have to pay to see these items that were originally bought with Birmingham residents tax in the way of rates and then council tax. It says maybe it was done this way to keep the riffraff out. Well, didn't keep me out, so that's obviously not working then. Trev Joyce gets the last one uh, today. And Trev says, thanks for taking us with you to the museum. I haven't been to Birmingham for years since I lived in Worcester. But a visit to the museum is now firmly on my to-do list. There you are. There's another one, look, you see? Keeping them going. Going back to the video of Lidbrook Viaduct a few weeks ago, you asked if anything remained of the other abutment. As promised, I have taken a trip down there and can report as follows. And then Trev goes on to say what's actually still there. Uh, what I don't get, Trev, is how you get to it in the first place. Do you walk to the far end and, get, and walk back up the track or do you have some other sneaky way of getting in there? We like sneaky. Yeah, well done. Thanks for that, Trev. He says, when I was down there, men were abseiling down the abutment you covered in your video to remove vegetation from between the masonry. I guess to minimise the risk of stonework being compromised and ending up in the village below. Can you imagine those huge great blocks tumbling down that slope? Blimey, they destroy anything in their path, you'd think, wouldn't you? Crikey me. I wonder if they were also going to put up a sign saying, Parkinson's walks, keep off. <laughs> Take more than that, Trev. <laughs> Film Club is uh, Cornish Tramway. I've been for another one of my films. I've cut a, a chunk out of that. I'll put the link to the full film after the description. I can't believe that this uh, tramway isn't better known. I mean, it's a wonderful uh, piece of archaeology stuck there with nobody knows anything about it. Well, that's not exactly true, but it's not very well known, then put it that way. So we'll have a look at that. Now, uh, next week's film then is on Kemble Station. Kemble used to be a, a hub of sorts once upon a time. It was, apart from being a station for the Gloucester to London um, railway, it also had a branch line going out towards Sirencester and also another branch line heading out to Tetbury. So quite, an in, quite a hub in its day. So it's very well worth a visit, I hope. So I'll see you down there next Friday then. Don't be late. Well, this late still supplies a small hydroelectric power plant. Oh, they found a good one then, did they? A good water supply. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's well worth a visit down there. So here we are. I couldn't ask for a more tranquil setting, I have to say. Just to give you an idea, Padstow, Newquay, St Austell, Bobmin, Luke's Gillian, just to there. We're just southeast of Luke's Gillian and we're going to walk along this pathway in the valley three and a third miles, apparently. Let's see what we can find. Turn right to the bridge. Uh, and on up there.
already there through the trees. You can see the central feature, the star of the show, to the viaduct. The art of the mason. Isn't that beautiful? The spring shadows and now make out the bridge. Built in 1839 to 1842. And strangely, although we're on top of a hill here, on top of the valley, uh, there's a sluice. First stone viaduct ever built in Cornwall. My gosh, they use some massive slabs of stone. You can actually see the sets here for the rail. It's a tramway, 200 meters long and 27 meters high. So that if we pop over here, something of a stunning view. East and West. It still has a use today, as you can tell from the rail down there. down there. See the gorse is having a go at it. And now this side of the bridge we find another leet. And the reason is that the bridge was actually used as an aqueduct as well as a viaduct for trams. It's actually used to transport water. Amazing piece of engineering. And looking very carefully at the granite sets, look here you can see where a rail chair sat in there. These things are positioned every uh, couple of yards on either side. Lamp post, do you think? Or drains to get any surface water down into the leet. We now head off in this direction, looking for more finds, what delights we find next. There's this for a start, which unbelievably is part of the old tramway tram rails. A junction or a splitting of paths. You can very clearly make out the tramway here, look. Sunken between banks and with the set still in place. Because it's an early tramway, it would have been horse-drawn. And there is something I have never ever seen before. It's an original rail chair. If I put my hand in it, you can see it's very narrow. So that would have been a tram rail. Not a railway rail, you see what I mean? A little bit farther along, and just to show off, there's a whole line of them. I didn't think it would get any better, but here look, the original rail. How amazing is that? Obviously the scrap merchants around here aren't very keen. Or spoilt for choice. I hope this comes out as pretty on the film as it is actually being here. I can't believe why this place isn't better known. 
you see just, just how it was laid. I thought it was a prop to start with, but that's not a prop, it's real. Another convergent, divergent crossing here, look. And looking very closely, you can see where the trucks sometimes want to go the other way and we're wearing into the rail. So we're now heading off along here. Here's the leak coming along from the way we've just come from and here you can see one of the purposes for it. As it turns and goes under the bridge and then shoots out over there, over what would have been an overshot water wheel. Unbelievably, the main part of it is still here. 1842 the mill was constructed. I don't know whether that was the original construction or not. Huge granite sets to build that out of. I've truly never seen anything like it. Huge mill, basically in the middle of nowhere. Pitch for the millstone right alongside. And this is kind of almost unbelievable. Here we are, middle of nowhere, and over here is a rail bridge. It actually crosses the incline that we were on earlier. That's a two mile incline apparently. It was actually constructed in 1840 by Nicholas Kendall as part of an eight mile carriage drive to Luxington Church. It took 20 years to complete the uh, eight miles and look at the train we've been on, I don't think that's uh, too bad at all to be honest. And there you see the incline stretching way up into the distance, right up there. Man oh man. Granite Clapper Bridge, in the middle of nowhere. Gaining some height at last. Finally, over the interview. Now that is what you call a viaduct and an aqueduct, don't forget. Eighteen forty engineering. You just can't get used to the scale of the thing. And I'll have to keep doing this, but I don't know what else to do. Well done David. Brilliant walk. Thank you very much. See you on the ferry.